So the title of today's talk is Beggars Can't Be Choosers. And, you know, I, I was thinking about all different ways to make this sign. But, you know, you could, you could have, like, cash only or no checks or, you know, I, only, I don't take American Express or, or whatever. And you think about all of the different signs that people have. And, I, you know, one of the things that I think is interesting in today's world, I try to do it too, I think – so many of us are so on guard against things, myself included, that I, I'm just almost waiting for someone to offend me. Um, and I try, I'm, I'm like, I, I'm pretty, actually pretty hard to offend. Like people sometimes at work are saying, man, I'm sorry if I hurt your feelings. I'm like, no, you have to have them to hurt them. I don't have any. So I, I didn't, no, you didn't hurt my feelings. You'll have to try harder. Uh, but, but, you know, when I think about this, um, one of the sensitive subjects, of course, e even just right off the bat, is someone could say, like, you know, that's not a funny subject. You know, somebody's homelessness or a beggar, there, it's not, there's no humor to that. But the truth is, in my life, I've actually done a, a lot of ministry that was street-style ministry or other types of things. And one of the things to remember is that, um, you know, homeless people are people, right? It's not my home that makes me a person. Uh, it's not where I live or how I live that makes me a person. It's my personhood that makes me a person. So the truth is there's lots of humor on the street. There's a lot of funny things. And I've seen incredibly funny signs. In fact, I oftentimes am more likely to engage with somebody who has a sense of humor than I am with somebody who doesn't. And so, you know, I've seen some of the same, one you, same ones you have. You know, I saw one that said, you bet you can't hit me with a quarter. Like, you know, again, somebody, again, from an inner city thing is like, yeah, that's an old one. We've seen that one a long time. But, you know, that, that that's pretty funny. There was a guy, um, I grew up in, in Boulder, Colorado, which is certainly a privileged place. But um, there were a lot of people living on the street there, uh, and most of them had PhDs. So I didn't feel too badly for them in different ways. Many ways, they probably lived as well or better than I did. But there was a guy that I remember was a street performer, and he had the best jokes. His signs were hilarious, and one of the things he would always say at the end of the show is, please put some money in the hat, or I will come date your daughter. Um, you know, and, and everyone was like, uh, five bucks, how much you need, you know, or whatever, because he was just, you know, but he had an incredible sense of humor, and I think it's so important in life to have that, regardless of where someone is, and, you know, again, I, I put this sign up there, because, you know, beggars can't be choosers on some level, I mean, that saying, if you know what it means, it basically means that if you're in a desperate need, you really can't be that picky, I mean, you can't say, hey, I, I'm starving, but I don't want that. I, I, could we go to a different restaurant? I actually had a guy where I was at a restaurant with my family, and I we were living pretty close to the to the bone, you know, in, in our own life at that point. And um, the kids knew you, you didn't order drinks; you just got water, you know, and you, you basically ordered off the dollar menu. And so. I, I, there was a, a guy there who was hungry, and I asked him, hey, would you like a meal too? And he said, yeah, could I have a combo number seven with a whatever and whatever? And I was like, well, actually, if you don't mind, if we could order off the dollar menu, that's where my kids are ordering too. And he's like, oh, I don't like that stuff. And, and then he said, well, could we go to a different restaurant? I've actually eaten here quite a bit. And I said, uh, not so much. You know, at some point I was like, no, that's, that's different. And what was I basically telling him is <laughs> beggars – can't be choosers. I mean, at some point, you take what you get and you like it. And again, I'm not trying to in any way um, talk down to any section of the world. In a way, I, I say this is the point of today's talk, which is that we're all beggars. We're all beggars. See, I, I saw this next one. And again, please don't be offended by it. I thought it was really funny. Um, can't speak, can't walk, no teeth, no job, dirty diaper, God bless. Um, and, and it has a baby there. And I, I'm thinking, you know, again, a baby, a homeless baby is not a funny thing. And, and yet at the same time, this is kind of a funny picture to me, especially if it's staged. Why? Because it made me think about the circle and cycle of life. Because the truth is, that's how I came in and that's how I go out. Right? And anything any, anyone has put in the jar of my life is a blessing I didn't deserve. It's something I didn't earn and couldn't earn. And again, that's a weird 
worldview for many people. In fact, that might be the opposite of what a lot of people think on today, because today a lot of it's all about my value, my worth, my, you know, my esteem, all of these things. And I think to myself, hey, I value myself very highly. I value you very highly. I value all people very highly, but we're a bunch of beggars. Let's face it. We come into this thing without a lot, and we go out without a lot. And I was thinking of down that list, and I was thinking to myself, that's where I'm headed to. I'm to the place in some point in my life, I probably won't be able to talk very well. I won't be able to walk very well. My teeth will all have gone out and the gold will have been sold. And, you know, I'll be there in my dirty diaper, basically asking people for help and needy. And again, my point on this beautiful day isn't to talk ugly truths. It's to actually talk some things that I think can be very, very helpful. Because we'll either be a better beggar or a bitter beggar by some point in our life. And that's what my hope is as we look at these scriptures. It's just becoming better beggars. Because I don't have a choice whether to be a beggar or not. I don't really have a choice in life to go through and say, hey, I am in command. I am in control. I am the person who sets my own destiny. That's not true. That's really not true. Do I have choices? Do I have Things that I can affect, absolutely. But one of the most important things I can affect is my attitude. So, you know, I came in helpless. <laughs> I'm going out helpless, but I'm not going out hopeless. I'm a person who can be truly uh, very content with a lot <laughs> or a little. Um, I've stayed in some amazing hotels and eaten some unbelievable food. And I have stayed in some unbelievable hotels um, or hostels, you know, um, where they were hostile. You could spell them H-O-S-T-I-L-E, you know, and, and the bed bugs did bite and all that stuff, you know. I mean, and, and so did the springs that sprung up through the thing and you brought your own bag. And, you know, I've, I've definitely lived on that section of the street as well. And so when I think about it, those things can make you bitter or they can make you better. There's some people who could only stay at the Ritz, right? It's, oh, oh the five star isn't quite nice enough. The bed is still kind of hard. I need to switch rooms, right? You've met people maybe who are like that. No matter how great it gets, they're still bitter. And I've met people who had so little. And yet I, this, I said, man, there goes a better person than I. I have a lot to learn from that. And it's not to romanticize poverty by any means. But this is, again, a thought that I hope you'll think through. I went in helpless, but I don't have to be hopeless. I wrote this down for my, my um, high school kids the other day, which is, I am better off than blank. And I invited them to write in mentally it a name to somebody that you think you're better off of. Now, for them, I asked them to think of all kinds of things that they like to compare on, like I'm better looking than so-and-so. I said, don't you know, actually say it out loud, but you know who you think you're better looking than in this room. And then you know, think of who you're richer than or you're more athletic than or you can jump better than and all that. I said, this, th there's going to be people you can fill in that blank, no matter who you are. And then there's going to be another blank, which is so-and-so is better off than I am. Because I had a kid uh, talk about how another kid was rich. And what they basically meant was their driveway is longer than mine and has a crest over the top of it. That's what they were talking about. And I was like, well, yeah, your driveway is a little shorter, but the house at the end of it is pretty nice too. And I don't think any of us have missed meals. So when they were looking at that comparison, I was thinking to myself, these two statements will always be true but never helpful. They're never going to be helpful. There's always someone better off than you, and you're always better off than someone. And that doesn't mean I have to feel guilty for whom I'm better than off than or feel condemned for who's better off than I am. See, what, what is really important, what is really important, this is what I tried to speak to them and to myself about, is that committed to being a better person and making everyone's life better that I can, if I can, if there's some way for me to make somebody better off, then I should, even if they're better off than me already. Let's say they're already more athletic than I am. Well, I've got to put them down so I can feel better. No, I can rejoice in their amazing accomplishments. That doesn't make me a worse person. I can be, and you know what? I might actually learn something from them. It doesn't mean I'm ever going to be better than they are, but maybe I'm better than I was. And I said, the more I think that way, man, I'm just becoming a better beggar. I don't have to grow bitter because somebody's better than I am. And so when I think about it, this is what today's teaching is about. Because 
spiritually speaking, everyone that we're going to see in this chapter is a beggar, whether they realize it or not. Two of them are obvious, and the rest of them are oblivious. They don't realize that they, too, are beggars in this chapter. And so it doesn't matter how much money we make or don't make, uh, we won't take it with us. It doesn't matter what kind of house we had or didn't have while we were here, or what car we drove or didn't get to drive, or what clothes were in our closet or what clothes were taken to goodwill to be given to somebody else. You know, when I think about this, bank balances don't make balanced lives, right? They don't. And so unless we understand that we're beggars, we'll tend to be choosers in life. We'll go through life choosing. And sadly, what most people choose is to be bitter. When you really think about it across it, uh, uh, the journey that many people go on is they come in kind of, you know, little baby and they're happy baby and they're running around. And by the time they get older, you spend sometimes times with adults and you go, man, they're just bitter. They're just bitter. A lot of bad things have happened, things they didn't choose, things they didn't like, things they didn't want. And they're mad at everyone. They're blaming everyone, God and anyone who will stand close enough about their rheumatism or whatever. You know, and, and you think about it and I go, I, all of those things are happening to me. I mean, I think about it. Uh, my, my hands don't work like they used to. And I go to stand up and it's like, oh, and then I go to sit down. And it's like, whoa. And, you know, it, you go, I, I didn't choose that. I'm just a beggar going through life, but I'm going to try to be a better beggar, a better beggar as I go through life. If God didn't do things on my timetable or doesn't, and I get hurt and I complain and all these things, that's not going to help anyone. And so this is what we do as we go into this chapter, the last book or last part of Mark 7. We see two beggars. One's a woman with a demon-possessed daughter. Okay, that's, that's not anything she chose or wanted, right? The other is a deaf and mute man. And I doubt that he chose that either. Now, some would say, oh, well, he you know, made life choices that led to that. And you go, okay, all right. But in both cases, Jesus dealt with them in ways that might have caused them to get upset or me to get upset or you to get upset, walk away in a huff. But they would have if they'd done that, if they'd been a chooser and chosen, say, don't treat me like a beggar. They would have ended up maybe bitter, but never better. And so I think about this, Jesus does things that I don't expect, that you don't expect, but the end of the chapter says, he did all things well. So I think about that, I want to learn from that. I hope you do too, Mark 7, 24, this is what it says. From there Jesus arose went, and went to the region of Tyre and Sidon, and he entered a house and wanted no one to know it, but he couldn't be hidden. Now I remind you, he was uh, growing in popularity, but part of the reason he was growing in popularity at least with some people, is that he was giving away a lot of things, right? I mean, this was a stage of his ministry where he would, like, throw a free lunch and then talk with people, right? And, and anyone in, in college knows all you got to do is have free food, and people put up with almost any lecture. Like, do you care about that? No, but they are having nachos. Um, you know, and so people will stay for that, right? And, and what you see is this was happening, but people were coming and getting his help, and this is, is what you see in verse 25, if, if you think on it with me. It says, a woman whose young daughter had an unclean spirit heard about him, and she came and fell at his feet. And the woman was a Greek, a Syrophoenician by birth, and she kept asking him to cast the demon out of her daughter. Now, I, I take that time to say Mark. Mark was a Jew, right, who wrote this book, and it was written about a Jew, Jesus, and he makes a point of telling us about the territory, the geography there. He talks about Tyre and Sidon. That was a Gentile territory. And again, um, this is not a new problem. It's as old as, as humanity, and it will continue as long as we are human, um, which is there were people from different places who didn't like each other if they were from different places. They didn't understand um, Tyre and Sidon, you know. And so the Gentiles didn't like the Jews by and large, and the Jews returned the favor, and nobody liked anybody, and everyone was mad, and everyone was bitter, and they could all talk about why. I mean, it was very easy to see why. Um, they had done all kinds of things to each other over the years and would continue to do so, but she was a Greek, right? She was a Greek, and this is a true statement, and again, it's very humbling for me to speak to such intelligent people. There are a lot of smart people in this room. Um, the collective intelligence of, the, of that side of the room is far greater than this. Uh, but we can think on this together, I hope. There are groups that no matter who you are, even within that group, everyone sets 
you know, ladders and rungs. Uh, uh, you know, the untouchable ca caste systems of the world even have untouchables within the untouchables, which is funny. I mean, people just love hierarchy. They just love it. Because as long as they're a, they can find someone that they're better than, right? I mean, I, I can always find somebody who's worse off than I am. I don't know, well, I'm, I'm not as bad as that guy. And so comparison is one of those things that is, is just going to be a part of the human condition. Uh, but a Syrophoenician, she had a hyphen in, in what she did. What did that mean? That meant people from this region didn't fully embrace her and people from that region didn't fully embrace her either. She was a mix. And it talks about that here. So this is a lady who would have been very low on the social rung. You have to understand. First of all, she was a lady. I'm bringing you the no news. Don't be mad at me. I'm just simply telling you throughout history, what every society, with very few exceptions, if you had uh, people who were low on the caste system, the ladies within that were lower still, right? So we know that. We know she was a Syrophoenician hyphenated name in an area where she would have been a nobody's nobody, right? I mean, she would have been to the bottom of the barrel. And to make it worse, she had a daughter. It doesn't talk anything about some guy who was, you know, in this picture. There's a lady and she's got a demon-possessed daughter. Now, if you've ever dealt with people um, who have challenges, we could talk all day long about whether this was a disease that their society labeled demonic or whether that you know, was actual demonic. I, I think those debates are almost irrelevant compared to the reality of this lady's situation. <laughs> the big question is not, is it a demon or a disease? The big question is, what are we going to do about this? And so when you think about it, she would show up at a school like ours and say, does your child have any special needs? Well, she is demon possessed. <laughs> okay, well, she'll fit right in. That's great. Um, well, we'll shadow, we'll have it, yeah, she'll, she'll work great with the rest of our hormonally challenged and charged children. Um, Carissa's horrified by what I'm saying. But you know what I'm saying? Uh, th this was a tough situation, right? And again, I don't mean to make light of it, but come on. You wonder what this woman had been through. I can promise you she had horror stories beyond even my capacity to listen to them, or yours maybe. And she had heard that there was help somewhere. I don't know where else she'd gone, but she went to this place. She fell at the feet of Jesus. Now, she wasn't worried about what people were thinking of her, I'm sure, because people already thought nothing of her. They didn't care. She had nothing to lose, I can assure you. Verse 26, she kept asking him. She, it says she kept asking him. It wasn't like one request. It wasn't like, um, uh, help me, help me. Uh, but she was a beggar, not a chooser, right? To see this story in all its glory, I'm gonna pull some thoughts from a parallel account in Matthew 15, if you wanna look at this one later. I'm just gonna read this thought. It tells us the words she was using as she begged Jesus for help, okay? It's very interesting for you to think through. She said, have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely demon-possessed. And the response in Matthew 15, Jesus said nothing. Okay, so she said, son of David. Son of David, that was a messianic code word. All right, this was her culturally appropriating some form of Jewishness in an attempt to try to get the Jewish Messiah to do something for her. It was. There's no denying that as you look at it. These were not words she knew from her upbringing or anything else. It was somebody saying to me in town, there's a, a healer from a, a spiritual thing that you know nothing about, but he's really good. And I go, well, what's, what's, the, what's the phrase that I'm supposed to use? Well, use this. I don't even know what it means, but I'm just going to go say it and hope that they help. And this woman came in absolute desperation. I think it's important to see a, a, a demon-possessed daughter. Again, returning to that thought. She says the right words, right? Son of David, have mercy on me. She's on her knees. She's doing everything right. And the, and the response is all wrong in my book. It's silence. And I don't know if you've ever felt God's silence, but it's one of the most deafening sounds that anyone could ever hear. Um, it has brutalized my life at times, truthfully, uh, where I'm like, God, I just really need you to answer on this. Cricket. 
And you think about this, that is going to be common to anyone, whether they have faith or they don't. There's going to be times where you just feel completely alone in the universe. And I can't imagine how this woman felt. Matthew goes on to tell us that the silence is broken by the disciples. You can count on them, right? Matthew 15, 23. Because you know the followers of Jesus always follow Jesus in example. So this is what they said. Jesus <laughs> said nothing, but they said something. They said, send her away. Get rid of this lady. <laughs> this, this, she's hurting the PR, man. People are not going to come to you if you've got people like this in the line, right? Send her away, get rid of her. And I don't know if you've ever found that some of the followers of Jesus that you expect to help you can hurt you more than any. I have had that said to me, and truthfully, as I heard people's stories, I'm like, yeah, wow, can't vouch for that. You're, you're right. That was probably insult to injury. That was salt in the wound. That was an attempt at doing what they thought was right for them, but it certainly wasn't right for you. So I can imagine this lady walking away right then. Right then would be a great time to just turn around and say, look, I've had it. That's it. This guy, Jesus, silent treatment. His disciples should have been silent and weren't. I'm done. But she wasn't done because she was a beggar not a chooser. And Matthew 15, 24 says that Jesus answered the disciples and said, I wasn't sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. See, he tells them, hey, I came to the Jews first. I'm a Jew. I came, I was promised to the Jews. I came to the Jews. I came to the Jews first. And it's interesting because he's basically saying my, my mission, I have, it had phase one, phase two, and I'm in phase one, and phase two is unto all the world. Why? Because Ironically, his own rejected him, right? This is part of the amazing and ironic story about the, the Gospels to me, which is that Jesus came to his own and his own disowned him. And he says, oh, well, then I'll just go to anyone who wants me. And so when I think about that, I think, oh, man, Jesus knew what it was to be a beggar as well. He knew what it was to come to Bima and say, please, I, I plead with you to see the truth. Nope, didn't want to do it. And so when you think about the prejudice that was against the Gentiles, Jesus loved to set people up to knock them down. And what I mean by that is, have you ever seen somebody who thinks that someone's doing something for one reason, but they're doing it for another reason? So Jesus, they're thinking, yeah, Jesus doesn't like this Syrophoenician woman and her little demon-possessed you know, bum, I don't want him here. And they, they're like, send her away, and he's gonna, right? But he doesn't. This is where it gets so good. They considered her filthy, untouchable, unclean, unworthy, all of these things. And they're thinking, Jesus is thinking just like I'm thinking. He's got the same mindset I do. But no, he had a mindset that he was trying to put into their mind instead. And that's what he's trying to do with you and to me. And guess what? I fight it too. But I think if you'll think it through with me, there's something pretty deep here. She could have gone on away from Jesus, and she had her reasons to be bitter. She could have said, fine, oh, you're God, the, you're God on earth? Well, I got a few things to say to you about how things have been for me. And born into Syrophoenicia with a hyphen in my name. and blah, blah, blah. She could have given it to him and had a right to do so, right? But what would have been the accomplishment? Well, she would have gone away bitter. But she chose to be a beggar instead. She asks and says, Lord, help me. It's hard to imagine a more humbling situation than this. Very discouraging. Silent treatment from Jesus, send her away from them. He tells his followers, doesn't even say anything to her, I was really sent to the Jews. And they're like, yes, <laughs> we're the chosen people. And this woman refuses to take no for an answer. She keeps saying, Lord, Lord, help me. Just help me. Just help me. Uh, all that's interesting. Say whatever you want, but help me. If we go back to Mark 7, this is what it says in verse 27. Jesus' response to Lord, help me. He says to her, this is him talking to her for the first time now. He's already said some stuff to his disciples. He says something to her. He says, eh, let the, let the children be filled first. It's not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs. And she said to him, you'll be hearing from my lawyer for talk like that. No, this is what she heard. This is what she said. Yes, Lord. 
But even the little dogs at the table eat from the kids' crumbs. And this is mind-blowing for me. Again, maybe you don't like it. Maybe I don't like it at first, but I think about it. This scene is very hard for some to understand. It seems very out of character for Jesus. It seems incredibly callous. Did I read this right? Did this woman just get called a dog by Jesus? That's degrading. Um, talk about kicking someone when they're down. She's coming to him and calling him Lord, and he's calling her a little dog. Um, and she would have had, again, every right, every right to feel wronged here. Every right. I acknowledge it. I acknowledge it in my own life. I acknowledge it in yours. And there's some things that we have to properly understand here. There are two words in the Greek language for dog you need to know. And the reason the, the passage here even puts it little dog is it's different. See, we have a little dog at our house, little dog, a uh, little Gracie. Uh, but there's a word for uh, a mangy, uh, like kind of scavenging wild dog. And that is the word that the Jews would use derogatorily toward all the Gentiles, dogs, ravenous wolves, wild pack animals. Again, that was just common in that way. That's how they thought of them, animals, Gentile dogs, wild, wicked, mangy mutts. And so as Jesus picks an analogy and basically saying, hey, I got to feed the family first, which anyone would agree with, I think, on some level, Got to feed the family first. Got to, I got three kids, man. I got to feed them first. Can they get their meal first? And if the guy has said, yeah, man, but I'll take, supersize it and I'll take your leftovers. That's amazing humility. That's an incredible thought. If somebody says that versus, no, I want the combo meal. I want to feed me first and then you think about your kids. What? So what's going on here is a humility, a humility. And when I think about that, it's funny because humility cannot exist at any social strata, you know? You don't have to be rich to be prideful. It helps, I suppose. But inside this situation, you have him using a word for the pet. It actually wasn't common. You come here to this town, everyone's got 42 dogs, right? And they're all pets. And they treat them better than their kids, right? Sorry, uh, kids uh, couldn't afford to go out to eat, had to get the special medicine for the dog, right? So, I mean, in our society, there's almost an inversion sometimes of pets, where pets are put on the pedestal, um, you know, and, ah, oh, dogs, you know. But, but, but there, it was an uncommon thing for someone to have a pet. But they did have some pets. And so Jesus is basically says, well, you know, can't, can't, can't feed the, the, the family pet before the, the kids. And she goes, I'll sit under the table and take whatever you got. And I love this because the crumbs that fall from heaven are better than the stuff you could get on earth. This is the point. If you can wrestle through this stuff, if I can wrestle through this, I go, I will sit under the table and take God's leftovers and live a great life. Or I could search for everything on earth and demand my rights, argue over whether this was uh, right or wrong or whether I'm being treated fairly. Am I being treated fairly at work? No. Are you being treated fairly at work? No. Are you being treated fairly at home? No. Are you being treated fairly by society? No. It goes on and on and on. Now, Am I committed to making life better for people? I have dedicated my life to making people's lives better anywhere I found them. If I found them from a point of privilege, I tried to find out how can I still be of help to you? If I found somebody of absolutely no power at all, it's how can I best be of help from you? Is that exalting me? No, it's exalting Jesus. I had no idea how to live this way until I met him. And so when I think about this, what, he's, he's doing this, and I can only picture the smile on Jesus' face when he's like, you know who the smartest person in the room is? This lady. You know who the idiots are? These 12 disciples I picked. You know who the morons are? The guys who went to school and can't figure this stuff out. The, the people who don't realize how desperate they are how needy Peter was. Peter needed a long, lifelong lesson in treating people right, depending not on whether they were Syrophoenician women, but whether they were people. And see, 
Peter, in the book of Acts, was a disciple who ate only with the Jews when he was with the Jews, but then the Gentiles, no Jews to be found, and he'd be real cool with the Gentiles. He's like, all right, I'm good, I'm good. And then his friends came from out of town. And super mature Peter the apostle, who's in the stained glass everywhere, didn't want to eat with people because his friends were in town. He didn't want them seeing him even with that. And you go, oh, see, Peter had a lot to learn from the Syrophoenician woman. And that's where Jesus was doing something in them by doing something with her. And she, she gets the joke. She's the only person who goes, okay, cool. Treat me like the family pet, and I'm good. Uh, and, and I think about this. Think about it in our own lives. Our, our kids, and our kids are amazing kids, but part of the thing that they, they didn't choose to be pastor's kids, but they got to be pastor's kids. So what does that mean? Um, that means they've had to put up with being used as illustrations throughout their entire life. You know, uh, That's why they need therapy. And so, when, so here it is. Here's some right now, uh, which is imagine yourself, just put yourself for a moment in, this, in the position of a parent, right? And you've cooked a great meal, right? You cooked an amazing meal. You, you've done everything you can do. And the kids go, we had that two days ago. And you go, I'm good, I'm good. All right, who wants some? No, I don't want any. I don't, it's too, it's got too, what's that green thing in it? And you're like, and meanwhile, Gracie's down there, our dog. It's like <laughs> the tail going a thousand miles an hour going, I'll take it. I'll take any of it. I don't care how often we had it. And, and you think about that in life. Again, we get, we get so worried about thinking that we're treating someone that we're being mistreated or that some group's being mistreated. I'm like, everyone's being mistreated. People are mistreating each other all over the place. And what if all of a sudden, instead of it, I was just grateful for anything I got. I'm just grateful for anything I got because I came into this world naked and I'm going out naked. And if anybody was nice to me anywhere along the way, that's more than I deserved. Well, I deserve everything because I'm a valuable person. And you go, who taught me that? Jesus taught me that. Jesus taught me how to treat people right. I know how to treat people wrong. Go, go put a bunch of kindergartners from any society, anywhere, anytime. Mix them all up and they will mistreat each other. That's what they do. Because we're so often a chooser rather than a beggar. And so we make the wrong choices. But being a beggar is a great choice. You don't really have a choice on it, but you can decide to be a bitter one or a better one. And look at Jesus' response to her. Matthew 15 says it this way. Oh, woman, great is your faith. <laughs> He's like, wow, I've only marveled at one thing, two things, really. There's two times it says that Jesus was shocked. One was people's lack of faith and this woman's faith. He goes, this lady, no upbringing in religious thought, no pedigree from anywhere no example anywhere in her life that's great and she gets it more than all of the rest and he did it for their good maybe you say well it still looks a little mean to her but you look at what's going to happen he first of all he compliments her he says this lady's the only right one in the room and by the way go ahead on home everything's cool with your daughter see she says i'll take the crumbs and he gives her the whole bread of life. Sends her home with a nice take-home bag and says, here, let me open up the floodgates of heaven and pour out grace upon your life. All right. Jesus said to her, for this saying, go your way. The demon's gone out of your daughter. Everything's good. She goes to her house. She found the demon out and the daughter lying on the bed. See, I think about this. Becoming a better beggar, let me, let me again just share with you what I'm learning in my life. Again, uh, I would love to know what God's teaching you in your life about humility and faith. But one of the things is, I, my beg list has changed dramatically over my life. Things I would have begged the Lord for if I had thought about it when I was 17, I would have begged for a lot of stupid things. Better car, really fast car, really amazing car that would make everyone think I was really cool. I don't even think about things like that very much anymore. What I think about is I beg God for my family. 
I beg God for my friends. I beg God for a better world and for me to be a better person in it. And even if the world gets worse, for me to not grow bitter as a result of that. Those are the things, my beg list is different, right? I, I beg to, to have the grace. I, I'll say it even publicly because it's all I really ask. And I, I have no right to it. I have no claim to it. But I would love someday to live to see my children's children. That's like something that's been on my heart since I first had kids. I was like, it'd be cool to see my kids' kids. I would beg for them to have great friendships for them to have quality people, to be quality people, to devote their life to making life better, whether someone has money or doesn't, whether someone has fame or doesn't, whether someone is athletic or isn't, whether somebody is awkward or not awkward, just because they're people. Uh, are they privileged? Yes. Are they underprivileged? Yes. We're all beggars, and, I, and that's where I look at this, and I go, this would be my request for God. I don't think the world's gotten better. But I can, and they can, and they can make a corner of it better. And so humility is not easily offended, right? Pride gets its toes stepped on so easily. And again, you don't have to be any one thing to be prideful. You know, I've, I've, I've known people who had nothing who were very prideful, and I've known people who had a lot who weren't prideful at all. And so faith believes in the goodness of God even when things are unfair. And I've thought about it many times in my life that, you know, if something bad happens to me, my, my wife's had to put up with me through my whole, most of my adult life, and she's seen, I hope, some changes, uh, both positive and negative in my life. I mean, not all, <laughs> I wish I could say I'm always moving in the right directions, right? But why me would have been a very common thought for me if something went wrong in my life early on. Why me? Why me? I'm a good guy. You know what? If something good happens to me, <laughs> why me? Why me? Why should I be the recipient of that? I, I, why should something good come into my life relative to someone else's? What, what have I done to deserve anything other than nothing? I, I was born so privileged I can't even imagine it. I was born to parents who wanted me. That's a good start, right? My parents actually wanted me. Uh, my mom says it changed soon after because I was... A very annoying kid. I mean, just uh, colicky and, and like, where's the receipt on this child? But you know, again, <laughs> I'm I just you know, I, I I have lived beyond a great life. I have had health most of my life. I've had sections of it where I didn't, and then I'd go like, oh man, I took that for granted. You know, I got educated more than I deserved. Some school let me in when another school wanted me out. You know, high school was like, get him out. And college, for some reason, said, let him in. Um, I look back to those things and I go, I, almost everything I've ever had in my life, if I could write a, a sentence of an autobiography, I would title it, Bumbling into Blessings. Just, whoops, something good happened in my life. And I think about that and I go, humility and faith, it's, it's a very simple thought, is that I, I, do, I do not believe that I deserve anything. I have very low expectations, and they are exceeded constantly by God. I just go, wow, this is amazing. Humility, I don't expect anything. I'll sit under the table and take God's crumbs. And the faith that says, man, God's crumbs are better than I could have imagined he makes a good crumb cake. And so faith realizes the silence of God and even the hard and hurtful things are part of the process of growth. I'm like, thanks for the silent treatment you learned. I learned to wait for a better answer and not just take the first one from the disciples, which was send them away, or you were talking to somebody else when you said that. Remember, he said things to them that he wasn't saying to her. And learning who God is addressing and who he isn't is an amazing thought. I mean, again, these are deep thoughts to wrestle through, and I hope you will. When the woman was willing to take even the Lord's leftovers, she got God's best. 
And God wants us to be grateful. And that's just, that's just a thing. And, and verse 31 Departing from the region of Tyre and Sidon, he came through the midst of the region of the Decapolis to the Sea of Galilee. And they brought to him one who was deaf and had an impediment in his speech. And they begged him, notice the begging word there in verse 32, to put his hand on him. This is what they said, please just touch, touch this guy. I know you can make it better. Right? And Jesus takes him aside from the multitude. I think I love the personal nature of God. And he put his fingers in his ears. And it says this, Jesus spat and touched his tongue. And looking up in heaven, he sighed. Think about the sigh of God toward God the Father. He says, ephatha, which is a word I have no idea how to pronounce ultimately. And it says, be opened. That's what it means. So he says this word. And they, why, did, why did Mark feel the need to put it in its original language and not, um, you know, and, and then translate it. Well, the reason is, I think, because this is the first word this guy heard, and it was in his language. Fascinating to me. People around us said, What's it, what did he say? I don't know. He spit and said, and I'm like, wow, that's weird. But the guy didn't think it was weird, right? The guy went, I know what that means. And think about this. He puts his fingers in his ears, you know, gives him a wet willy kind of, touches his tongue. I mean, <laughs> sorry, I laugh when I read the Bible. I, I can picture people saying, no, we begged you to put our, your hand on him, right? Not your finger in his ear <laughs> and you spit in his mouth. I mean, that's like weird. <laughs> like how many people can say Jesus spat on me, right? But the thing is, the bottom line is beggars can't be choosers, right? Can you imagine this guy saying, no, 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 I was going for the hand healing thing. I was in that line. I, yeah, I'm not in the spit line. This is the, I, 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 as a matter of fact, take back the healing. I don't need it. I, I don't need it if you're going to treat me like that. I don't want spit therapy. And, and the thing is, I love to choose how and when and where and why God works in people's lives, my own especially. <laughs> Here's my thought of how you should do this. And God says, I spit on your plan. And, and I go, but, but, I, but, but my spit plan is pretty good. And I'm like, okay, okay. I don't even know what that word means, but be opened is a good thing. And so beggars can't be choosers, my friends. Immediately his ears were opened and the impediment was there. I'm going to go sliding through some of my slides. So humility puts us in a better place for grace. That's, that's just a, a truth. Regardless of what bitter place you might be in ever in your life, and you might find yourself in one. Man, it's incredible how uh, an accident, a, a, a thing. I just read a story the other day about a guy who had a stroke in his 30s. Man, he was an incredibly intelligent guy one day and learning to walk talk and do the most basic of tasks, the next. That can put you in a better place. But he, the whole article was written about how after he finally learned to write again, he was writing this article about how he was in a much better place than he was before the stroke. Wow, that's interesting. Put you in a better place for grace. And Jesus has always done the most for the least. I don't know if you've noticed that. Why is it? Because the least have the least to lose, and they're willing to, to do that. That's why he said sometimes yeah, it's very hard for God to do for a person what he would love to do because they don't have their hand out, right? They got their fist up, or whatever, or they're, oh, no, I'm not a charity case. Listen, I am a charity case, God. Pour the grace into it. Do with it my life what you could if I would just believe that I am really nothing and you are everything. It's amazing what he could do. Might spit, don't know. Might put his finger in my ear or put his hand over my mouth and say, you shut up for a while, I'm gonna have somebody else do the talking. Immediately his ears were opened, the impediment of his tongue was loose, he spoke plainly. What do you think his first words were? Gross, <laughs> you know, or whatever else. I don't know what it would be, but I would imagine it was gratitude. Probably. And Jesus commanded that they should tell no one. Interesting, verse 36, that he commanded them. The more he commanded them, the more widely they talked. 
um, you know. It's funny because he commanded us to go talk with people and, and share love and joy and grace and peace with them. And sometimes we don't. But they were astonished beyond measure, saying, he's done all things well. He makes the deaf hear and the mute speak and the demon daughters are fine. And I'm like, this is what I think about just with results. Again, I, I can look at my life and say, well, I am going to be a chooser, not a beggar. I choose not to be a beggar. I will be proud of myself and I will value myself and, I, and, and all those things. And I go, okay, I can try that. I did try that. I tried it. I didn't do all things well. I still don't do all things well. But coming to a realization that I don't do all things well, but Jesus does all things well. Lynn knows I have added something to my vocabulary, and with this I shut up, which is, but what do I know? See, I, it's funny, in Miami, I actually got to a privilege. I mean, talk about a privilege. Talk about the wrong guy getting to do something amazing. But I got to do a radio program where people would call in and ask questions about life on the radio, and I got to answer those for years, you know, the answer guy. And people would even say, you know, that, oh, there's a the guy with all the answers. And I'm like, I'm the guy with all the questions, man, I promise you. Um, but I think about it today, and I'm like, I'd call in if somebody had the answers, you know, I'd, I'd love to call me and ask a lot of questions. But I, mostly these days I look at different things and I go, man, I just, the, I'll see a kid with different problems, and I think, should we... Should we kick them out or ask them up or, or do whatever? I mean, yeah, but if you hear their backstory, it's just heartbreaking. And I'm like, oh, this kid, we may be the one great thing in their life. But, and you're like, oh, what can I do? And I go, well, I don't know. I'm just going to try to be better every day and try to make every day better. You know, if I can interact with that kid, I'm going to try on some level to make their life better, you know? I don't have to worry about whether they come, but their family makes a lot more money than ours. Well, so what? This kid's having a rough time. Can I make their life better? And so when I think about that, Jesus always did the most for the least. And I'll just look around and say, who, who needs the most? And who can I do something for? Uh, you know, okay, how can I do that with it? And that's kind of the conclusions of what I thought of as I went through this passage, which I'm a beggar, right? I come in with nothing, I go out with nothing, and in between I try, I have a lot of needs that people met, so I try to meet a lot of needs. People loved me for no reason, no reason. They didn't know it to me, but they did. And you know what? They gave it to me as an act of grace. And so I don't have to look around and say, well, does this person deserve this or not? Does this deserve, person deserve me to serve him? No. Jesus served people who didn't deserve. He, he was mistreated when he treated people only well. He did all things well. And I can assure you, the Syrophoenician woman is not mad <laughs> that she got the crumbs from the table of the king. When I look at that, I say, a better beggar knows which table to sit under. That's all I know. I know how to sit under the best table and to encourage one beggar to another beggar. You know where to find the best bread? It's right over there. <laughs> it's right over there. And uh, I've got no claim to it. i got no exclusive claim to it. There's plenty to go around. Uh, keep, keep finding food wherever you can find it. But I can tell you, sitting under the table of Jesus has cast amazing things into our life and I would encourage anyone to test him on that so if you're too proud to beg well when life takes its worst it's easy to get bitter but if you just say I, I'm, I'm just a better beggar just getting better at it all the time say Lord I know what to ask for and I know what to where to go and so God thank you for these thoughts I thank you that you would give uh, each person in this room, the capacity to receive from you all that you want for them and to uh, make as much of a difference in this world as they possibly could uh, by pouring those things back out. Uh, it's a great world uh, out there, beautiful day out there, and yet there are ugly situations in the most beautiful places, and there are beautiful situations in the ugliest of places. And I pray that we would 
uh, learned to look with these kind of eyes, uh, learned a lot from a Syrophoenician woman with a demon-possessed daughter here this morning. We pray it in Jesus' name.